While grown up poor in Massachusetts in the 1950s, the son of an abusive alcoholic father who left when he was just 12, it's unlikely that Russell Banks ever imagined that he'd one day be called the most compassionate fiction writer working today by the New York Times. Similar doubts might have crossed his mind in the early 20s, when Russell was, by his own admission, a bit of a barroom brawler. Still, he showed promise, and inspired by a book from another working class hero, Russell set out to be a writer. His breakthrough novel was called Continental Drift. The book told the story of people who, like Russell, had the odds stacked against them. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, but it was affliction about an embittered small town cop that brought Russell to a whole new audience. You sneaky son of a bitch, I got your number now! His next novel was called The Sweet Hereafter, about a small town dealing with a terrible tragedy, also made into a film directed by one of our favorites, Adam Agoyan. I'm a wheelchair girl now, and it's hard to pretend that I'm a beautiful rock star. Now Russell is telling the story of what might be the ultimate outsider, the convicted sex offender, in his latest novel called Lost Memory of Skin. He finds humanity in people who are feared and despised and asks whether society allows redemption for everyone or just a chosen few. Please welcome Russell Banks. Great to see you, Russell. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thanks for coming in. You know, you, you're looking at the dark side of, of, of humanity is not new for you, but it's like you've taken one more step with, a, so, with a convicted yeah. sex offender, right. almost empathetically. Just, I mean, why, right. you, tell me about the, why, why you went down that road. Well, it's hard to explain. It isn't as though I sat down one day and chose that I think I'd like to write a novel about convicted sex offenders living under a causeway in South Florida. I mean, right. no, it didn't happen that way. Uh, for, I think for most novelists, certainly for myself, um, the... The context, the world, the fictional world that you're going to end up spending three or four years of your life in comes to you rather than you go to it. And, and in this case, uh, I spent six months a year in South Florida in uh, Miami Beach. I have a condo down there. And um, I look out over the Julia Tuttle Causeway, which connects the mainland um, to, uh, to the barrier islands where Miami Beach is. And about four years ago, articles started appearing um, in the local newspapers about a colony of convicted sex offenders living underneath this causeway because of a, a law which had been passed which restricted them from living anywhere within 2,500 feet of where there might be children, which meant they couldn't live anywhere in the city, really, except um, Terminal G at the International Airport or out at the eastern end of the Everglades Swamp. And so there they were dropped like trolls under a bridge, in a way. I could sit on my terrace and look out and see this uh, causeway. and. And I just began to wonder what it would be like uh, to be under that bridge if you were a kid, um, you know, a loser type kid who had crossed a, a line you didn't quite know existed and had committed a, a minor offense, but one that's nonetheless, you know, serious enough to spend some time in jail. And now you're in par on parole for 10 years, uh, sitting uh, in, a, in an encampment, a shanty town alongside serial rapists and, and you know, other other types of sex offenders who were, you know, much more serious. Because once we release uh, these offenders from prison, they're all lumped together, you know, right. as convicted sex offenders. Yeah, and you never really see the, the new, and I know it's hard to say this, the nuance, because sex You don't see the distinctions right. between a first, second, or third class offender. We sentence them according to those distinctions, roughly. Yeah. Um, but, um, but we don't see them once they're released. They have the same basic uh, conditions. But, but here's the thing, and I don't know this if this is the case, but one thing I noticed about your writing is that you, you've done this really good job over the course of your career of, of existing in the margins, like talking about those in the margins, like mm -hmm. you mentioned, and probably because of how you grew up, maybe in the socioeconomic reality mm -hmm. you grew up, you didn't have a lot of cash as a kid, right? <laughs> you also saw some of that, that you know, uh, that civil rights movement, and yeah. I wondered, you know, what, what you remembered from that time, because you, you clearly yeah. saw from a different perspective. Well, I arrived in Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina, and I was 24, 1964, and I was married and, and had a child, and I was already thought of myself as a writer and so forth. But I walked into, into that fall, um, when Chapel Hill was, the, this, the town was actually being integrated, the theaters and restaurants and bars being integrated. So I was in jail 24 hours later. It was an impossible, impossible to go into that world, even if you weren't a political activist, as I wasn't at that point, um, and not become engaged uh, by it. It was, it was so intense and, and it surrounded us. Um, and, and then a week later, I was at a integrated, racially integrated party and it was shot up by the Klan. So I suddenly thrust into that and um, and it, it was the beginning of my political education. Up to that point, I think I had been a kind of 
romantic uh, kid who um, identified with the underdog uh, but didn't have any kind of political um, intelligence or analysis or historical perspective on it regarding race or regarding class. And that was really the beginning of it, uh, was the engagement with the civil rights movement in North Carolina and then uh, later as that grew, uh, grew into the anti-war movement in, in the later 60s and into the 70s. Uh, um, Where does the activism in you come from? Like, I mean, you said you, you experienced that stuff and that helped you put, be politicized, mm. but you still had to be the guy that wanted to join Fidel. You still had to be the person who 24 hours into the integration would go, I'm going to participate on this side. Mm. Your story is a pretty difficult one. I mean, your father was very abusive, but mm. were you, where did it come from? It, I, it's hard to say, you know, where these things come from. Um, there was never any one person or any one event that I can point to. I can say I probably felt somewhat marginalized myself as a kid. Um, growing up in the 1940s and 50s, we were very poor. We were um, um, divorce and abandonment and alcoholism and domestic violence. These were things that, if they were occurring in your family, um, made you feel marginalized in that era, much more so than they do today. Um, but even today, of course, it would, it would have a similar effect, I think. And I have a feeling that that's what made me identify more easily with people who were marginalized for much more oppressive reasons than my domestic reasons. Do you have a movie plan for this yet? Oh, I just got a, an a email from a director I really respect and admire who had just finished the book, and he's already saying, I love it, I want to make this movie, you know. We'll see. I, I, I have a <laughs> feeling getting that one finance is going to be really tricky. <laughs> I think it would be more e easily done on television and cable TV now. I mean, you can do more so. daring things and, and, uh, and darker, more ambiguous uh, oh, stories. God, I mean, on, you're based on in Miami, the whole Dexter character is incredible, right? Yeah. Right. The, like the right. sympathetic... Serial killer. <laughs> I know. If you can go there, I mean, yeah, why yeah. not go to this poor kid who's hooked on the internet? <laughs> For sure. Um, well, you've got a couple other things in production, don't you? Yes. Um, um, I'm doing um, uh, The Darling uh, with uh, a Canadian uh, wonderful director, Denis Villeneuve, yeah. uh, based oh, he's in so Montreal. Amazing. Yeah, we do Ensemble. He's just he's great. And, and Jessica Chastain is, is going to be uh, in the, take the, the, the lead in that. And, uh, and I wrote the screenplay, and um, Scorsese is executive producing it, so we're putting the package together on that now, and, and hope that we can be there next year. When you year. write the screenplay, you have this relationship with the story, because it's your, it's your story, too. Um, when the director takes it, does he say, okay, listen, that's got to go, Russell, that's got to go, this has got to go? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a man that carries any ego into the process? <laughs> you can't, you know. Uh, you, uh, you can't carry the book around with you into the process. What, what do you do when you're writing a screenplay? And I've learned it now, I've written enough of them. That is, and, uh, you take the novel, and whether it's my own or somebody else's, I've got to do the same thing. And you, and, and you think of it as a kind of a big round jar with a flat bottom, and you throw it on the, on the ground, smash all the pieces, and then you, you go through the pieces and you pick out the flat ones and, and leave all the rest, because the flat ones are the ones you can reassemble into a movie. I mean, it's as if that's what you were doing. And, yeah. and the movie's going to be two-dimensional compared to the three-dimensional jar that you made. You can't see a, 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 a film adaptation of a novel as a, any way a translation. I don't even like the word adaptation. It's just pillaging is what it is. You're going in there <laughs> and you're pulling out of, out of, out of the, the novel the pieces that will make a good movie. Right. And they may not be the pieces that made it a good novel. That's true. You know. Well, you're in good hands in Denny Villeneuve. Oh, He's I know. He's an absolute I superstar. Know. Russell Banks, uh, the name of the book here, Lost Memory of Skin. Good to see you. Thank you. We'll be right back.